Okay. All right, everybody, how are you? Um, as uh, I promised you, I have the best of the best right here with us, uh, Sam Shimon. Uh, he is on my right side, but uh, for you, probably is on your left side. So not good to be on the left, right? You know. But anyway, don't tell him that. <laughs> so, uh, Sam, uh, I'm uh, really excited, brother, that you were able to uh, join me, and I'm thankful for technology, of course, for allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would like, brother, before we dive into anything, if you can open us up with a word of prayer, that would be great, brother. Hallelujah. <clears throat> yeah. Amen. Father, we praise you and we love you. <clears throat> we praise and love your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we praise and love and adore your Holy Spirit. Bless the session. Bless my brother Al Fadi. Bless his family. Bless my children, Father, and watch over their mother and bring us all closer to you. And bless the people who are listening. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, who today we commemorate his death on the cross for our redemption. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Father, to speak truth clearly without error and fill our bodies with the breath of life, the help we need. <clears throat> to glorify you and the holiness we need to delight your heart, Father. And we trust in you and we depend on you and we cling to you. And we ask that you sanctify us, that Jesus will be glorified in this second and in our lives, and that we will disappear and Christ will appear through our words, touching hearts, so that people will fall more in love with Jesus, their only hope of salvation, the risen Lord of glory, the Lamb, that was slain from the foundation of the world. Thank you, Father. Lord Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. So, brother, let the people know what you've been doing lately. I mean, you've been doing an amazing series. So let them know how they can go and tra uh, track you and uh, follow you and get notifications and everything. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I hopefully people know know our connection by now because they've seen us on Al Sira. Uh, Sierra International, Al Sierra. Yeah, because you know, you're Arab. Every time I talk to an Arab, I'm always thinking, El something, El Islam. El Amen. I'm an Al Savior right here. That's right, baby. <laughs> That's what you are. El, right? El, right? Yeah. So, what it is, is I, I run the YouTube channel Shamunian. Glory to Jesus Christ. Praise His holy name. It's growing. And I try to do a live stream at least several times a week. Lord willing, in time, I'm going to learn how to do short videos, pre recorded videos by God's grace as He keeps providing for us to do it. It gives us the holiness to serve him with integrity for the glory of Jesus. And also, don't forget, a lot of the information that you're going to hear us talk about is found on answeringislam.net. Answeringislam.net, you'll find articles by me and others. Outstanding men of God, women of God, loving Jesus Christ and answering common Muslim objections. But one thing I want them to know. Even though we're answering Muslim objections, objections, the objections are not just raised by Muslims. You have Joe's witnesses that use the same arguments, Unitarians, atheists. So if you study the arguments, it'll help you be grounded in the Bible to know what the Bible says and address a variety of groups for the glory of Jesus Christ. So answeringislam.net, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, which is the blog. And I update that at least two or three times a week. So pray for our success, pray Amen. for our anointing, pray for our health and holiness and the provision to glorify Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. So let's start. Basically, we'll talk a little bit about the crucifixion today. And uh, I want to start with, for instance, the Islamic view. As you know, uh, Sam, Muslims deny it because of one single verse. Yes, chapter sir. 4, verse 157. I mean, uh, practically speaking, let's give our friends here some practical ways to try to refute this argument. And if there are Muslims here, we welcome them to send us their questions, of course, mm -hmm. about this. But go ahead. Yes. Well, when you talk about 4157 that's the passage that muslims point to to show that the quran denies that the historical jesus was killed by crucifixion the problem however is that even muslims <clears throat> specifically sunni muslims because we're talking about sunni muslims here they are not in agreement exactly what happened to jesus in his final hours in other words if you go back and look at the commentators, the tafsirs, like from Ibn Kathir, you'll find traditions saying that one of Jesus' disciples was made to look like Jesus, and he died in Jesus' place. Well, that's one view. And you know the literature better than I do, brother. You, Your mother tongue is Arabic. You have an advantage. You read them in the original language. <clears throat> Ibn Kathir attributes that tradition to Ibn Abbas. Now, Ibn Abbas, for those people who don't know, is not only a companion of Muhammad, he's Muhammad's first cousin. Their fathers were brothers. And he's considered one of the greatest Muslim scholars. Now, 
there are other traditions. Some say it wasn't a disciple of Jesus. Some say it was some gentleman named Tatawis. And then you have the tradition says it was Judas. But now you have modern Muslims like Shabir Ali, who's championing what's known as the apparent death theory, the swoon theory, meaning he believes that the Quran does not deny that Jesus was crucified. What, he's, what he claims is that the Quran is denying he was killed by crucifixion. So he was on the cross and he swooned. And then Allah later resuscitate him. So my question to Shabir is, why don't you just take it all the way? If you're willing to admit that Jesus was on the cross after being beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, people just died from the scourging. Going through all that intense pain, <clears throat> persecution, only to pass out, to be resuscitated, what's the point? Why not exactly. just go and then resurrect them? And this is an Ahmadiyya uh, view, of course, Ahmadiyya Muslim view, 100%. as you know. Yeah, yeah it's, and for the people who don't know, the Ahmadiyya sect is considered a heretical sect of Islam that started in the 19th century by a gentleman named Murza Ghulam Ahmed. That's why it's called Ahmadiyya. He claimed to be the Messiah because he reinterpreted the narrations attributed to Muhammad, which say that Jesus would come physically to the earth from heaven. Because according to Islamic tradition, Sunni tradition, Jesus is physically, bodily alive <clears throat> above the seven. In heavens that's according to the Quran 4158 355 of the Quran he's with Allah and then he'll come back to the earth to kill the Antichrist well this man this Indian he was Indian Murza Ghulam Ahmed said no you are misinterpreting those hadiths those hadiths are not talking about the actual Jesus physically returning it's talking about someone who comes in the spirit and likeness of Jesus and I am he so he claimed to be the Indian Messiah a prophet after Muhammad so right that organization is condemned, and you know that better than I do. They're not even allowed to perform hedge, from what I was told. Saudi Arabia does not recognize them, will not allow them to make hedge. Right. right, and even Pakistan doesn't recognize them as uh, uh, true Muslims. In fact, if you want to get a passport in Pakistan, they make you sign that you're not an Ahmadiyya Muslim. In other really? words, you're not even a citizen, technically speaking. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, you brought up something interesting, of course, the, the idea that uh, finally somebody is starting to succumb to the fact that the crucifixion happened, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I've always, uh, you know, uh, said this. The fact that the Quran took the time to report the crucifixion, regardless of who was crucified, that shows that the author of the Quran could not deny the historiosity of the event itself. Exactly. He had to try to come up with an explanation of what happened. Now, see, that's assuming that the interpretation of that passage is actually consistent with the Quran. And as you and I both know, I, we actually did, I think, I, did, I do recall we did something on this previously. You can read the Quran in such a way where it doesn't deny that Jesus was killed by crucifixion. But be that as it may, one thing I want people to realize, which is quite interesting, there is no report attributed to Muhammad telling us how Muhammad explained the verse. Isn't that interesting? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I just want the, the people to hear this. They're not, not Muslims to hear this. Ironically, <clears throat> the very verse <clears throat> that's led to over 1 billion Muslims to question the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus, you do not find any, any report attributed to Muhammad telling us how Muhammad understood the passage. So that's quite ironic. Now, with that said, you can actually interpret the Quran, that passage, in such a way where you don't end up with the denial of the crucifixion. Contrary to <clears> the oh, sorry, very the verse. verse. Oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> For some reason, my voice, because, man, I'm not young anymore, man. I'm getting old like you. My voice is giving out. But, yeah, so that, that's assuming the interpretation by Sunnis is correct. Because you and I both know there are other groups, uh, like the Ismailis, that's a sect of Shia Islam. They interpret it to mean that they didn't kill his spirit, though his body was killed, right? Right. So they're, they're all over the map. And you know what's ironic about that, Al? That verse says that those who disagree are following nothing but conjecture. And yet, ironically, it's the Muslims who follow nothing but conjecture because they can't even figure out the accurate or the precise interpretation of the passage. So the very thing the Quran accuses us of 
it's actually true. The Muslims are trying to make heads and tails out of this passage. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. So uh, I'm interested also, I mean, you, you deal a lot lately with the Jehovah Witness. By the way, everybody, uh, Sam have done amazing work in refuting Jehovah Witness, which in my view, I call them the Muslim Christians, actually, because they're almost the same <laughs> when it comes to how they argue against Christ. What is their view out of curiosity, by the way, on the crucifixion? Now, a lot of people will be shocked to hear this because the Jehovah's Witnesses claim to believe in the Bible, but they don't believe in a physical body, bodily resurrection of Jesus. And this is important to hammer. Mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, they do not believe that the physical body of Jesus was resurrected. What they believe is, is that the physical body of Jesus was disposed. It was deteriorated, disintegrated, uh, annihilated pretty much because why? Here's what the Jehovah's Witnesses actually believe about Jesus. They believe that there was a spirit creature named the Archangel Michael, which we believe, but not their Michael. He's the first creation of Jehovah. This spirit creature, the Archangel Michael, created all other things. When the time came for the redemption of mankind to take place, the Archangel Michael pretty much was wiped out of existence. And a human embryo was created in the womb of Mary. And the life force of Michael was transferred into her womb so that human being, he was nothing but a human being. And I want people to understand what Joseph's witnesses believe. He was nothing but a human being. Jesus was nothing but a human being, but he had the life force, whatever that means. Your guess is as good as mine. And then had the memories of the Archangel Michael so that the human Jesus wasn't the Archangel Michael in human flesh. Because the Archangel Michael ceased to be and the human Jesus came into existence with the life force and the memories of Michael. Then when the human Jesus died, he was wiped out. The Archangel Michael was recreated with the memories of the human Jesus. So there's really no continuity. They'll tell you it's Jesus, but if you ask them, is it really Jesus? Because Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, said that the man Jesus is dead, forever dead. In other words... There is no Jesus in heaven with a human body, with a human nature. It's the Archangel Michael with the memories of the earthly Jesus. So they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. You know, brother, I mean, just uh, believing in what they believe in is a miracle in itself, actually. It's kind of an amazing because sometimes, why do people complicate things? That Our theology in the Bible is so simple, so straightforward. Yes. And yet people like to ignore it and bring their own baggage just to try to promote their own ideas. Yeah, it's 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 so well. This is a clear sign of a diabolical satanic influence in the world because Amen. We, Amen. we know the Bible is God's word and it tells us about creation and why creation is in the mess that is that's it's in today. There is the kingdom of darkness. You have Satan and evil spirits, and they are doing all they can to pervert the true gospel to keep people away from the true Christ. So. This actually demonstrates how true the Bible is, that someone picks up the Bible and does not want Jesus to be who he is according to the Bible. So they have to then explain the Bible away or misinterpret the Bible or deny the biblical teaching because they do not want to accept the real Jesus, the real God, the real spirit, the real gospel. Now, why? Why don't you just, Looks like I mean, just accept who he is? If Jesus is God, what's your problem? Why do you? Because, again, there is sin and Satan working, the kingdom of darkness, evil spirits, Satan, who will not allow mankind to accept God on his own terms and accept God as he is because they know if they accept the true God, they escape the clutches and power of Satan and escape the wrath of God. And Satan's on a mission. His Amen. goal is to damn as many people to hell as possible out of his hatred for God and humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh we have somebody by the name Yusuf uh, Sauri. Yusuf, you're saying, where is that written? Uh, what are you talking about? Could you be more specific? Are you talking about what we said about Jesus or what Jehovah Witness are saying? Uh, could you be more specific? Now, someone also made a comment right now yeah. saying that Jehovah Witness are actually Hakub uh, uh, Torian, saying that uh, Jehovah Witness are distancing themselves now from the uh, teaching of Charles Russell. Is that? Uh, yeah, well, what it is, is they're not going to 
go around and boasting that Charles Taze Russell is the founder of the movement. Got there it. is actually another group, another group that still sticks to the teachings of Charles Taze Russell. Their exact name slips my mind, but there's actually another group that I think they're actually called Bible students because that's what I think he named himself. So God forgive me uh, and protect me from making mistakes. By the grace of Jesus, I want to always be accurate. But there's actually another group that perpetuate the teachings of Charles says Russell because Joe's witnesses did go beyond Russell and judge Rutherford. And right now the Joe's witnesses believe that the governing body of the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, they are part of what's called the anointed class. That's another thing. They believe there are two groups. There is what they call the little flock and the great crowd. The great crowd are those faithful Joe's witnesses whom Jehovah will either save from Armageddon or if they're dead, he will recreate them to live in a paradise-like earth. Because I this think, earth uh, our brother is having some difficulty with his Wi-Fi. Me? Yeah. Why? What happened? You froze for a second, but uh, you looked fine when you froze, actually. That was beautiful. How about now? How am I looking? <laughs> You're looking yeah. fine. Well, I don't know. Okay, so Sorry, guys, because as far as I know, my connection is pretty good. I don't know. What's it's no, no problem, my brother. We'll so do we're going? So we can continue? I just want to yeah. talk about the great crowd. They believe that the great crowd... Human beings will be recreated if they've died, or if they're alive and they're, they're scared Armageddon, will live on earth, where the earth will become like the Garden of Eden, and they will live on earth forever. But there is 144,000, and they alone will be born again to reign with Jesus in heaven, and they alone have the spiritual bodies that Jesus has, whereas everyone else will be in human bodies. So only 144,000 which they call the little crowd, part of the anointed class, will be in heaven ruling with Jesus over the rest on earth so that to them Jesus I'll will be back. Don't worry, guys. Earth. Huh? No, keep going. Because you said something you interrupted me, brother. I said he'll be back. Oh, you're scared. Oh. I'm like, what? What happened? Did I freeze again? I'll smash my computer. But you see, so, and they believe the anointed class. Here's another thing. The Bible is written for the anointed class for them to interpret. Only they can know what the meaning is. And that's why the governed body exists because they include the anointed class who are guided by Holy Spirit to properly interpret the Bible. Only they can do that. So that's what they believe. You want me there? I can't hear you anymore. Oh boy. Are you there? Okay. Now I can hear you. What happened to you, brother? Stuck for a lot. What's wrong with your stream yard? I'm not so sure, man. So. Let's uh, talk now about the significance of the crucifixion before we start talking about the resurrection. Uh, yeah. Brother, I mean, you, you said you just did a message, I think. Uh, yeah, I just finished the live stream. Glory to God. And I'm just, I'm scared if my sound's not working now. You got me paranoid. Is it working now? You'll be fine. Don't worry about it, brother. I'm scared. Going. You see how you Arabs are? You're always co conquering and dividing. Yeah, glory to God. I had the largest crowd today. Praise his holy name. I had about 250. Glory to God. It's all for his glory. In comparison to David Wood, 250. He had Abuna Zakaria, he had about 1,500, right? But anyway, and I talked about what makes Good Friday good. It's on my YouTube channel. It's now archived. What is Good Friday? I highly encourage you to go listen because it was about two hours where I tried by the grace of God's spirit to go in depth on the meat of scripture. And I, I felt it was quite powerful because I truly sensed the Holy Spirit anointed it. I was even moved to reflect on what Jesus did. So that's what we're talking about. But the significance of the crucifixion, it's because Christ took our punishment. He died in our place to save us from our debt of sin. He died in our place to pay the debt of sin because the wages of sin, the debt of sin is death, meaning being removed from God's loving fellowship and communion. And now, again, I have to be very sensitive when I say this because we have to recognize there are and I, have, I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, you're wrong. No, we have to be charitable to our evangelical brothers who are Trinitarian. There are Trinitarian Christians who believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. They believe it's God's word. They're Trinitarian. They believe in the evangelical principles of sola scriptura and sola fide, right? But they believe that if you interpret the Bible correctly in its context, original languages, it doesn't teach everlasting conscious torment. It teaches annihilationism. So I need to be sensitive and mention that 
because they are brothers. We can agree to disagree and have passionate debates to see who's interpreting scripture correctly. But either way, whatever view you take, Jesus paid the debt to save you from whatever punishment you believe the Bible teaches, either everlasting conscious torment or annihilationism, meaning you'll go to hell and you'll be punished in hell, whether the fires are literal or metaphorical. That's another discussion we can have because, you know, within Christianity, some say the fires are a metaphor for something else. Be that as it may, you'll be sent to hell and be punished for a period of time for the amount of sins you committed and then wiped out of existence. That's what the annihilationists believe. Whatever view of punishment you take, one thing is certain. Jesus paid the debt of sin to spare you from that. So if you believe hell is forever, he spared you from that. If you turn to him and trust in him and plead the blood of Christ to cleanse you of your sin, reconcile you to God, and also receive the gift of immortality, everlasting Amen. life, Amen. that Jesus earned not just by his death but by his perfect life of obedience on earth. That's what the cross accomplishes. Absolutely. And that's really what turned my eyes to Jesus when I start to hear about this and realizing that, you know what, uh, it's a big risk to take if you go and you discover that and I'm done, technically speaking. So as you know, Muslims are always terrified of the, uh, the, the grave and the punishment of grave and also judgment yeah. day. So uh, compounded by the fact that, you know, I didn't even know if my good deeds will be accepted to God. So all of that, you know, added up. Uh, open my eyes to the reality of who Jesus was and thank I'm thankful for the people who witnessed to me So brother, let's talk about the resurrection now. I yeah. mean obviously two days from now the Lord resurrect In fact, let's talk about the three days and three nights as you know that yeah. our friends always pick on always yeah. pick on that Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the objection it's in Matthew 12 40. So let me just get up these verses uh, Let me put them up for you Thank God for modern technology. We can look at the verses online. So the argument is in Matthew 12, 40. Let's look at it. <clears throat> I'm going to read it. Now, I know you like the English Standard Version, so I'm using that. Okay, Matthew 12, 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So let me repeat it again. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the, the earth. So the Muslims will quote this to try to prove two things. Number one, Jesus' entombment on Friday is not three days and three nights, right? Because he's buried Friday right before the start of Saturday. So Friday evening before Saturday, right? And then he's there Saturday until evening because again for those who don't know the jews their day start at evening at sunset they go from evening exactly. to evening right exactly so right now when the sun sets it becomes saturday right so that's exactly. how they go. so when it became evening that was saturday and then he he was raised early sunday morning so that, that's only what two days and a part of two nights at best so that's the argument. So here, it's a false prophecy. Jesus wasn't literally three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, in the tomb. Secondly, they argue, well, see, Jesus is saying, my condition in the tomb will be that like that of Jonah. Jonah was alive in the belly of the whale. That means Jesus would be alive. Therefore, he didn't die. He swooned and was resuscitated, just like Jonah wasn't dead. These are their two objections. Now, glory to the trying God. Christians have refuted this over the the ages. Um, it, my argument, I didn't, I didn't come up with the response. God has raised up mighty men and women of the faith for two thousand years since Jesus has founded the church, and He's raised up soldiers to refute Islam and bring Muslims to the feet of Jesus Christ long before I was born, long before Al Fadi was born. So, I'm not giving you anything new. These are the arguments that my Christian predecessors used to show this is a gross misinterpretation of scripture. The assumption is, the assumption is that when Jesus says three days and three nights, he means literally 72 hours. We know that's wrong. We know that's wrong from the gospel of Matthew itself. And I'm going to just read several verses to show you how Jesus himself, our Lord himself, interprets three days and three nights, right? Three days and three nights. Now, right. Matthew 16, right. 21. Here, Matthew 16, 21. I'm using Matthew, by the way. Matthew 16, 20. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes 
and be killed and on the third day be raised. On the third day be raised. Now, here's what's interesting. If our Lord literally meant 72 hours, three days and three nights, then he would have said on the fourth day, right? Think about right. it. Three days and three nights means that it's over on the fourth day. He said, no, on the third day. Why? Because three days and three nights is what we call a Jewish idiomatic way, what we call an idiomatic expression, to denote a period of time that lasts up to three days. It's not literal. Yeah, even we say this, Sam. I mean, when I ask you, what, what, are you going to this town and staying at the hotel for how long? Oh, three days and three nights. I mean, it's it's yeah. kind of like even these days we use these kind of idiom idiomatic yeah. expressions. And to prove it that we use something similar, if I ask you how many days you work this week, five days, but a day consists of 24 hours. That's right. So did you That's work right. four hours? Non-stop? Exactly. But, yeah, so... Jesus himself shows what he meant by three days and three nights. And it's not just Matthew 16, 21. They'll say, well, that's an isolated context. That's a contradiction. Well, hold on. Matthew 17, 22, 23. Matthew 17, 22, 23. And as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. There's that on the third day again. Not on the fourth day. If Jesus meant literally, he should have said on the fourth day. And they were greatly distressed. And then again, because I want you to show you, it's only one time in Matthew where our Lord says three days and three nights. But repetitively, Jesus says on the third day, on the third day, on the third day. Here. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. And they will condemn him to death. And deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he'll be raised on the third day. So I think you can see he didn't mean it literally. Now, did, was Jesus raised on the third day in fulfillment of his prophecy? Well, hold on. Let me show you one more. And then we'll go into the Jonah thing. Because I want to show you something from Luke's gospel. Okay. Let's show you Luke's gospel. Again, just to show you that Luke is in agreement with Matthew. That Jesus says he'll be raised on the third day. Okay. Luke 18, 31 to 33. Luke 18, 31 to 33. And I'll skip it. I'll go to 33 because he's talking about he'll be handed over to the Gentiles to be beaten, spit at. Verse 33. After flogging him, Luke 18, 33. After flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Okay. Third day. You go to Luke 24. Our Lord appears on that first Easter Sunday. Our Lord appears to two of his disciples, right? And the way to Emmaus. Emmaus, right? Right. And as Jesus is hiding his identity in order to get them to realize that the prophets had announced the death of the Messiah, so they shouldn't be shocked, they shouldn't be scandalized, but they should have been prepared for this. They say to him, now notice what it says, Luke 24, 21. They say to him, now he's alive in the flesh and they don't realize it. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. So here's Jesus, who's appearing alive in the flesh, resurrected, speaking to them. And they say, it's the third day since he died. And little do they realize he's alive on the third day, just like he said. Exactly. So there's exactly. a discre uh, discrepancy. Three days and three nights is not literal. That's not how the language works. Three days and three nights simply means a period of time lasting up to the third day. Lasting until the third day. And if you do your calculation, he was buried Friday before Saturday, before evening, where Saturday began. That's one day. Saturday, that's second day. And then he was risen, raised on Sunday, three days. It's not Amen. meant to be literally 24 hours. Yep. And I want to say uh, thank now, you, uh, James Lawson and Riaz Qureshi and, uh, um, you know, Mary and everybody who's writing these uh, basically passages. I appreciate that. Keep going, brother. And then about Jonah, two things. Number one, Jesus is not saying his condition will be like Jonah when he's entombed. See, that's, again, misinterpreting the text. Jesus is talking about the length of time, just as Jonah was in the heart of the belly for three days and three nights. And by the way, that doesn't mean he was literally in the belly for 72 hours. Remember what I'm saying. This is a idiomatic expression denoting a period of time that lasts up to the third day until the third day. So that doesn't even mean Jonah was in the heart of the belly for three days and three nights, literally, right? But his point right. there is that his point there is 
not the condition, but the length of time. He's not saying, well, if Jonah's alive, I'll be alive too. No, he's saying for the period of time that Jonah was entombed in the, in the belly of the whale, I will be in the heart of the earth for the same period of time. So that's the first point. But secondly, and more importantly, if you actually read Jonah chapter 2 carefully, there is a strong indication Jonah died because he talks about descending his into death, the pit. And he was praying. Yeah, exactly. Talking about entering into Sheol. That's the netherworld. The pit and Sheol refers to when the soul leaves the body and physical death occurs. So you can make a strong case that Jonah did die, but then from Sheol cried out to God and God restored his soul to his body, resurrected him, and then he was vomited out of the, the belly of the whale or the sea creature, because we don't know if it's a whale or not. We're not told. And so that it would be a direct parallel to Christ because Jonah did die and was raised on the third day like Jesus. Yeah. And I want to add a third view that I came across one time. And I think also that could be and kind of in between, uh, you know, as you know, Jesus dead, uh, death doesn't mean God died, obviously. I mean, uh, people think that uh, sometimes, um, you know, you can say that Jonah really uh, assumed that he's as good as dead. He's in the belly of a fish, been down for a couple of days. He, he realized he's, he's dying anyway. Not to mention, of course, the idea that maybe he thought his body is dead, but he's still alive. It's the same thing that Jesus, the body died, but Jesus is still alive anyway. So, yeah. I mean, there is, I mean, you know, you can no, look at it that way as well. The emphasis there, we just want to make sure people get it. The emphasis there is not on the condition of the body, whether dead or alive. It's on the period of time. Absolutely. That, that's that's now, Yeah, there was one question here, uh, and I think it's an excellent question. By by the way, is, is my brother, uh, he's, he's kind of like uh, wondering how to explain this. Uh, you know, uh, something just because um, Jesus died and... And now he has a glorified body. The question is, does that mean mm -hmm. God changed? I, I mean, that's the question. Have to define yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. Is it I a mean, Christian a... brother? What's that? Who's asking the question? Who's asking the question? Is it a Christian brother or a Muslim? I believe it is a Christian brother, but it could be a okay. seeker also. Yeah, well, that's fine. I just want to know if, because then I'll know how to address it, from what context they're asking me. When you talk yeah. about change, you're going to have to define what you mean. Because when we talk about change, we don't mean that God doesn't interact with creation, doesn't enter time and space, and doesn't. <clears throat> in other words, if you don't believe that God is in motion, meaning if you believe he's a static God, an immovable God, then how does he answer prayer? How does he intervene in time and space? How does he manifest his presence in creation? How does he do miracles? Because by God's by by saying God doesn't change, we don't say that God is not active, personally active in the affairs of men, in time and space, interacting with events as they unfold, and overseeing creation, sustaining it, and guiding it. So he's in constant movement and motion. And this you see. When our Lord said in John 5, 16, 18, when they're telling him, what gives you the right to heal a, a paralytic on the Sabbath? And what does our Lord say? If you go to John 5, 17, he goes, my father is working till this day and I too am working. See, what is Jesus exactly. saying? My father is still actively involved overseeing creation, sustaining creation, interacting with creation, being involved with the affairs of men and interacting with their actions. So he's in motion to use that term. When we say that God doesn't change, we mean that his essential nature, his attributes, just because he interacts with creation, just because he manifests in creation, just because he assumes human form or takes human nature, that doesn't mean that the attributes that he possesses as God have been affected. In other words, even when he becomes man, he's still almighty. Even when he becomes exactly. man, he's still present everywhere. Even when he becomes man, in his divine nature, in reference to his divine mind, he's all-knowing. Those aspects of his divine nature do not be, get affected. They don't increase. They don't decrease. But that doesn't exclude the ability of God to enter into creation, manifest his presence, and also appear as a man and take on human nature. That's the wrong Amen. definition. Amen. Now, amen. Amen. I appreciate that, brother. I just want to bring it up because I heard it a couple of times before also. And here's the other thing, Sam, of course, I mean, whether uh, he has a body or glorified body, he told us this himself, for instance, uh, the scripture talks about this in Old Testament, New Testament. So God wasn't 
all of a sudden change. No, he already foretold us about what's going to happen. And in Philippians 2, does take about, talk about he emptied himself by taking on. And, yeah, and, you know, they, that, yeah. and the emptying is the status and position out of essential attributes. Which exactly. Is now, on top of that, the Old Testament and the Quran and the Hadith all testify. Not because we believe the Quran and the Hadith, but the Muslims do. In the Old Testament, you have many appearances of God in time and space, on earth, in visible form, oftentimes in human form, appearing as a man and performing human activities, such as eating human food. Genesis 18 is a classic passage. In the Quran, you go to chapter 27, verses 7 to 9 of the Quran. If you go to chapter 27, verses 7 to 9, it says that Allah appeared and manifested as fire in a tree. Because what does it say in chapter 27, verse 7 to 9? Recounting the Exodus, when Moses goes to see that that flame and that tree, Musa, and it says the voice cries out from the tree, blessed is he who's in the tree and blessed is he who's around it. Well, the one who's around it is Moses. Well, who's in it? Right. Blessed is he who's in the fire. Blessed is he who's around the fire. And by extension in the tree, right? Who's in it? That's chapter 27, verses 7 to 9 of the Quran. Allah's in it, but how did Allah manage to squeeze him? Because again, the Quran, unlike what later Islamic theology says, the Quran testifies that Allah can appear in creation. In fact, there are passages that even Salafi Muslims, those who are what they call Athari Salaf, Salaf Asali, right? They'll quote, for example, chapter 2 of the Quran, chapter 2, verse 210 of the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, Ayah 210, and they'll quote chapter 89 of the Quran. Chapter 89, verses 21 and 23, where it says, Allah will come on the shadow shadow of the clouds with angels. And it says, your Lord will come with angels rank upon rank, rank on the day of judgment to judge the earth. Well, hold on. We know how angels appear. They appear visibly, right? Amen. But it says Allah is going to come with them. And he comes on the shadow of the clouds. Chapter 2, verse 210. Chapter 89, verses 21 and 23. And in the sound narrations, sound ahadith, Bukhari and Muslim, it says that at the last third of every night, Allah descends to the lowest heaven, the heaven closest to the earth, and says, who is supplicating to me that I may answer him? Allah descends from above the seven heavens to the lowest heaven, the last third of the night. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. And Bukhari right. talks about that on the day of judgment, Allah will appear in a form other than the one that Muslims know him by. And he'll say, I am your Lord. And they'll say, we don't recognize you as our Lord. Then he appears in the form that they recognize him. He goes, I am your Lord. And by that form, say, yes, you are our Lord. And it says he'll reveal his shin. I know. I mean, man, he loves soccer, bro. I yeah. love that. So how does Allah appear in creation? Because this is in creation because these are creatures. Or being judged on the day of judgment, they're not outside of creation, but he's appearing in creation in different shapes, different forms, and in one time he'll even reveal his shin. Yeah. So, Sam, I have a question for you. What is your view about where did Jesus go between the death and the resurrection? As yes. you know, there is this view that he went to preach. Yes. Basically, go ahead. Yes. Well, in Romans chapter 10, verses 6 to 7, and if you read Acts chapter 2, and you start at 24, specifically, it's actually 26 to 28, but again, 24, and you read all the way to 32, Acts 2, 24 to 32, because there, Peter quotes Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. He quotes David, the citation starts in Acts 2, 26, that David prophesied that God's Holy One would not be abandoned in Sheol. It says his soul would not be abandoned in Sheol, nor, right, his body would see corruption. And so Peter says that's talking about Jesus, that Jesus' soul was not abandoned in Hades. The Greek has Hades, Hades. Right. Greek for Sheol. And his body, his flesh did not corrupt. His flesh did not corrupt. Okay. So there we're told Jesus' soul. That's a little translation, by the way. You may get translations that will not translate it literally. It literally refers to his soul going to Hades, Sheol, whereas his flesh body was in the tomb. Then on the third day, the soul came out of Sheol because it says he did not abandon his soul in Hades, Sheol. It came back to his body, and that's why his body came to life. But this time his body was transformed to become immortal and deathless. 
And you'll find that in Romans 6, verses 8 to 10. He's deathless. Hebrews 7, 16, deathless. Hebrews 7, 24, deathless. As the Holy Spirit enables me to recall these passages for the glory of Christ. So the plain reading, his soul went to the netherworld. And Romans 10, verses 6 to 7, confirms that because it says that Jesus was raised from the abyss, abuso, the deep, right? He was raised from the deep, the abyss. Now, why is that important? Why is that term important? Guys, write these down because I'm giving you a lot of information. Luke 8, 31, write down Luke 8, 31, and then look at Revelation chapter 9, the entire chapter, chapter 9. And then Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3, the abyss is the abode of demons and where Satan will be locked up for a thousand years. The abyss. It's the same word, abuso. So here we're told that Jesus was taken out of the abyss. What abyss? When he was raised from the dead? Well, the abyss that the legion told Jesus, don't send us to the abyss, Luke 8, 31. Don't send us there. Revelation 9, it says that the abyss has a king over it. Named Abaddon and Apollyon. Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek, meaning destroyer. He opens up the abyss and demons come out and are released to torment mankind for five months. So notice what came out? Demons. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Who will be confined there? Satan for a thousand years. So clearly, when Jesus' body lay in the tomb, his human spirit, his human soul went to the netherworld. But it didn't go there to be tormented or tortured. I know there are people who teach that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. He went there, number one, to proclaim his victory over the inhabitants of the netherworld. Here I am, the victorious son. By my death, I have destroyed the power of darkness, the kingdom of Satan and sin, and now the grave. And also he went to what we call Abraham's bosom. Abraham's right. bosom, right? Where people are, basically. Where the yeah. righteous dead... Those who die believers. in faith exactly. are waiting in a state of bliss and peace. They're not tormented. They're not tortured. They're not in misery. They're in peace. But still, they were not in God's heavenly presence where angels dwell. There was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the righteous dead of all the nations. So when you take all the pieces of scripture together and connect them, then the picture we get, the picture emerges that Jesus went there to take the souls of the righteous dead and usher them into God's heavenly presence so that now after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus into glory, if you die as a believer now, your soul, your spirit leaves your body and now enters heaven where God is with angels and Christ in his glorified body. But that happened after. Amen. And this Amen. is the belief of the ancient church, by the way. It's in the creeds, right? It's in yes. the creeds, for example. You have Catholics, and I believe, I don't know if Orthodox do, they'll recite I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Now here's it. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended into hell. But the word in Greek is not Gehenna, hell. It's Hades. He descended into Hades. Yes. Okay, brother. So we're going to get into the resurrection, which will happen on Sunday. Uh, tell us about the... Uh... Uh, the importance of that, first of all. Well, I mean, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to know what the importance of the resurrection is, just take a moment over the weekend, prayerfully meditate on 1 Corinthians 15, the entire chapter. That is a whole chapter devoted to Jesus' resurrection and our res resurrection and how they are linked. 1 Corinthians 15, so read it. Read 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Jesus has not been raised, then our faith is in vain because our faith is anchored on the fact that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth died for our sins and was raised on the third day as miraculous confirmation that God has accepted his death on our behalf so we can receive forgiveness and reconciliation and we, can, we too can live in God's presence in glorified physical incorruptible bodies. But if Jesus has not been raised, how do you know that God accepted his death as payment for our sins? Because what is the, the wages of sin? What's Death. the punishment of sin? What is the consequence of sin? Death. Death. Amen. Particularly physical death. So if Jesus paid the debt of sin and removed the punishment of sin, which is death, 
How do we know that the punishment of sin has been removed if he doesn't rise again? Because since punishment is death, if he's going to remove the punishment, that means he removes death. Well, how do you remove death? Resurrection. Right? Justification as a result of that as well. Yeah, well, that Amen. means, yeah, because that means you've been justified. But my point is, how do I know that the punishment of sin has been removed? Exactly. Well, the punishment of sin is death. If he removes the punishment of sin, that means he removes death. Well, if Jesus then paid my debt, so the punishment is now removed, and that punishment is death, that means he has to rise again. Otherwise, if he remains dead, then I have no assurance that the punishment and penalty of sin has been removed, namely death. So it makes sense. It's logical. Amen. In the context of the theology of salvation, right? I mean, okay, so you pay the debt of sin, and it's death. It's physical death, number one, as well as death in the sense that I lose intimate communion and fellowship with God and experience his wrath. All right. Well, if you paid the debt and now it's, the punishment's removed, you're released. Well, that means we must be released from death. That means he must be released from death. That means he must rise from the dead. And lo and behold, he rose from the dead confirming the debt has been paid, God has been satisfied, God has accepted that debt, death has been destroyed, guaranteeing our eventual physical bodily resurrection where death will be no more and we will be deathless like him. Hallelujah, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen to that. Um, anything else, Preston, uh, brother? Uh, well, actually, I, I can tell you uh, there, there is another thing I was asked earlier today uh, for you to address. Uh, I mean, I sometimes shy away from addressing things, you know, uh, that I feel are not really essential for the faith. But, uh, um, you know, sometimes, as you know, in Matthew, uh, Matthew is unique in, in mentioning that some of the saints basically rose yeah, from the dead and went into uh, the cities and they were uh, also uh, seen by others. Yes. So uh, the question is about that incident, basically. Yes. And so what are they? Or uh, is it coming from? Oh, yeah, uh, just clarifying, just okay. clarifying what that incident is. So why why is that happening? Well, let's look at it. It's Matthew 27, 52, 53. And then I'm going to cross-reference right. it with Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14. Okay, so guys, write this down. Matthew 27, 52, 53. Ezekiel 37, verses 12 to 14. And we pray the Holy Spirit for enabling us to recall scriptures and may perfect that ability in us and then live out the truth in the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Please, Lord, perfect this in us. Father, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Matthew 27, 52 to 53. The tombs also were open. This is what they're referring to. So when Jesus died, tombs were open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now notice when they were resurrected meaning return to their bodies after Jesus' resurrection. So though the bodies were laid bare, because earlier it said an earthquake took place when Jesus died. So the earthquake, the impact, just destroyed tombs. It laid tombs open, bare, it, so that bodies were now bare because the tombs had been broken from the impact of the earthquake. Okay, now, the bodies laid bare, Jesus rises, they rise, and they appear to many. Now, number one, I want you to notice these are saints who recently died. How do I know they recently died? Because it says their bodies were laid bare. And ask any scholar, especially archaeologist, who knows the history and the background of the first century, especially in Israel and Jerusalem. In Jewish burial, what they would do is a year after someone dies, they would go to the tomb and collect the bones and put these bones in what they call boxes called ossuaries. Exactly. Because they knew that the bodies deteriorate. And so they go and collect the bones and put them in ossuaries because they wanted to preserve the bones for the resurrection. So they thought that you have to have the bones and God would use the bones to resurrect the body. Okay, now, you find this also in the Old Testament in the case of Joseph when he dies. If you go to Exodus 13 and you read 19 to 20, Exodus 13, 19 to 20, it says Moses took the bones of Joseph out of Egypt to bury the bones in the promised land allotted to his sons. So notice bones. Same thing with Elisha in 2 Kings 13, 20 to 21. 2 Kings 13, 20 to 21, it says that when they were trying to bury a body, there were marauders, robbers. So the people out of fear threw the body on top of the bones of Elisha. And when it touched the bones, came to life. So Elisha's body deteriorated. It was bones. What's my point? 
if these people had been dead for a considerable amount of time, they wouldn't be bodies. They would be bones. That's right. Okay, that's in fact, in, in Jewish, in Jewish uh, thought, that it must have been less than three days, actually. Okay, so if it was less than three days, or what well, my point is, they're bodies, not bones. Right. Okay, so Good point. I mean, they had just recently died, and not all were raised. It says many were raised, and they were raised temporarily like Lazarus, like Jairus' daughter, like the widow's son. This is a temporary resurrection. And why did God do this to coincide with the resurrection? As a sign of what we call the already not yet motif. And earlier I was sharing this in my, in my stream. The Bible teaches something called the already not yet. Already means the prophecies have already begun to be fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. But their complete fulfillment, the fulfillment <clears throat> awaits his return for it to be fully realized, completely realized. So the prophecies have begun to be fulfilled at the first coming, but will be completely fulfilled at his return. And what takes place at his, at his return? This ties in with 1 Corinthians 15. The general resurrection, specifically the resurrection of the dead in Christ, who are raised and transformed to become immortal like him. So what the Lord was doing here was giving us a foretaste of what's to come. These bodies that have been raised is a foretaste of something greater and bigger. That when Christ returns, all the dead in Christ will be raised, not temporarily, but immortally. And here, let me give you a foretaste for now to show you he is the one, he is the Messiah, and he will complete the job when he returns. But here's a deposit guaranteeing he's the one, put your hope in him. And this partial fulfillment is anticipated in Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14. Let me read Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14. What God says he'll do as a sign of his blessing upon his covenant people in restoring them to himself. Watch. Amen. Uh, the valley of the bones. Well, no, yes, yes, but specifically one section of it. Ezekiel 37, 20, 12 to 14. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus saith Adonai Jehovah, the Lord God, the Lord Yahweh. Behold, I will open your graves. What happened when Jesus died? Open Maybe your open. graves and raise you from your graves, O oh my people. I'll bring you into the land of Israel. What did those dead bodies come to life do? They entered the holy city, a reference to Jerusalem, right? So they entered into Jerusalem, Israel. And you shall know that I am Jehovah the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O oh my people, I will put my spirit within you. And you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am Jehovah Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declare Jehovah. Now, is it a coincidence that I'm Pentecost, right? <clears throat> Forty days after Jesus' death, he pours out the Holy Spirit upon the inhabitants of Israel. Amen. So you see the partial fulfillment of this prophecy of Ezekiel 37? Amen. And obviously, brother, I just want to clarify that uh, because it's a pro uh, partial fulfillment, Fulfillment that doesn't mean these guys remained alive. Now, is it a sorry, coincidence sorry, sorry, no, that no that's what I said. It's a temporary yeah. resurrection like Lazarus, like exactly, son, like Jairus's daughter. They will die again, right? Exactly. All right, brother. Um, what else, uh, you want to close us up with uh, concerning the resurrection? Maybe a message for those yeah. who are watching this. I just want them to be assured that the death of Christ and his resurrection are some of the best attested facts of history, facts that even those who are not Christian will begrudgingly admit. For example, don't take my word for it. Go on YouTube, look for Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman admits, Bart Ehrman is an agnostic slash atheist who abandoned the Christian faith, who doesn't believe God exists, doesn't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. But as a quote-unquote historian, quote-unquote historian, he admits on historical grounds, on historical grounds, it is a fact Jesus was killed by crucifixion. He further admits, as an historian, it is also historically certain that some of Jesus' own followers, this is a skeptic who's trying to destroy the Christian faith, but he makes admissions that are approving the Christian faith and exposes him as a liar. He says, it is historically certain that some of Jesus' followers, and he mentions two, Peter and Mary Magdalene, had visions that convinced them Jesus was raised physically, bodily into heaven and now reigns physically, bodily as God. And he admits Paul had the same vision that they did 
which led Paul to believe God raised Jesus physically, bodily into heaven, and now Jesus reigns physically, bodily as God alongside the Father. These are indisputable facts of history, though he doesn't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. What's my point? You can rest assured and have no doubt. Jesus of Nazareth walked this earth. He was killed on a cross. On the Hallelujah. third day, the tomb was discovered empty. Multiple followers saw him alive over a 40-day period, convincing them with infallible proofs he's not been raised in that physical body, but that physical body is now immortal. And he entered heaven with that physical body. And according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, write this down, 1 Corinthians 15, read verse 6, but I would read verses 1 to 6. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, Paul, even by Bart Ehrman's standards, Bart Ehrman's dating, he would date 1 Corinthians to 55 AD. Folks, pay attention, 55 AD. That's within 20 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. Within 20 years, Paul says to the people he's writing, Gentiles who are pagans, who worship gods and goddesses, abandon the gods and goddesses to worship a crucified Jew. And he says to them, more than 500 people saw Jesus alive after his resurrection, most of whom are still alive at the time of writing. In other words, there are about 500 people still living and breathing at the time of my writing That's that right. saw Jesus alive, that touched him, that walked with him, that have no doubt that he's alive and are willing to die for that claim, assuring you he is risen, he is not dead, he lives, he is the risen Lord, put your trust in him. And that leads me to another question. We'll end it with this. What would lead a group of Gentiles, because he's writing to Gentiles, within 20 years of the death of Jesus, what would lead a group of Gentiles to abandon the worship of the gods and goddesses of the Greek pantheon, give up on Zeus and Hermes and Artemis, Diana, and worship a crucified Jew, not even a Greek, a crucified Jew whom they knew was killed by the Roman authorities, a Jew, and worship him as their God in place of the gods and goddesses of the Greeks. Amen. What would Amen. cause them to do that? A resurrection that destroyed sin, Satan, and death. A resurrection that proves Christ lives forever and ever and can never die. Amen. Lord Jesus, keep us in love with you and preserve us to never betray you. He is risen. risen Hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah, my brother. Well, brother, uh, we want to start doing this now that we have different ways of doing this through Zoom, through this uh, platform. Hopefully, let's say whether weekly or biweekly, I would love to have you and we can continue to come up maybe with a, a uh, um, you know, lesson uh, plan and we can start tackling some important topics. Uh, we'll mix it up between apologetics and biblical teachings because I love your teaching and everybody will benefit from it. Amen, brother. Christ is reigning. God bless you. Your right, family uh, once again, my brother. Yes. Amen. Remind yes, everybody everybody. again, brother, where can they go and subscribe to your channel? Yes. Please remind them again. You, uh, on YouTube, Shamunian, S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N, Shamunian. Subscribe, watch the sessions. My blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, and answeringislam.net. Pray for my daughters that the Lord will bring us together forever. Provide for them, keep them healthy, provide for the ministry, and keep me holy for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And folks, maybe Sam is not going to say it, but the brother lives by faith. So yeah. uh, take the hint and go and become a Patreon patron and give to his ministry. We all live by faith, but Amen. I'm here. I want to honor my brother who took the time today after doing uh, his own two hours to come here with us and bless us with this uh, teaching. Brother, as always, you know how much I love you. I love you God too. bless you. And, and we will uh, see you again soon. Take care.